I'm going to start with introductions. I'm Scott Slaky. I'm the uh, representative of District 26. Good evening, Della Bellotti, representative for District 24 of Kiki County. My name is Les Carlos. I'm in the center for Kamekia and a little bit of this area. District 10. Good afternoon or early evening and aloha. Aloha. I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come here on a Monday, the first day of the work week, to talk about a very controversial issue that's important to our entire community. I also want to thank Majority Leader Scott Saiki, Representative Del Albulati, Scott Nishimoto, who's probably stuck in traffic on King Street, and Kobayashi, my council member, and Senator Leslie Hara, who's a neighbor in some ways to being up in Manoa for putting on this town hall meeting. Thank you so much. I wanted to just make a few brief points um, that are up here, and that's my only slide for this PowerPoint presentation. The first one is history. Why are we here today? We're here because we're talking about getting the authority from the legislature to extend this excise tax for a sufficient number of years to complete the first 20 miles. And I would like to then build the extension up to Manoa out to downtown uh, Kapolei. But here's the point, and I was in the legislature back in 2005. We were talking about building rail once again. This was our fourth attempt to try to build rail since Neil Blaisdell was governor. He was, I mean, mayor, and he was mayor back in the 1950s. Each attempt failed, and the Federal Transit Administration was getting very fed up with the city and county of Honolulu. We go to them, design a project, Asked for the support the input, they'd give it, and when it came time to vote on funding the project, there wasn't the political will, and they, it died. Three times in a row. So the Federal Transit Administration, which is under the U.S. Department of Transportation, came up with what they call the Honolulu Rule. The Honolulu Rule means put your money up first, and then we'll talk about the project. Senator Inouye, who has been passionate about rail since he went to the Senate in 1960, said, because of the Honolulu Rule, come up with your funding source first and then design the project. So in 2005, with the approval of the legislature and the political bravery of the city council, they voted to give us the authority and the council extended the excise tax, half a percent, up to 2022. So we started raising the money before we even had a route designated, before we had the technology decided, before we knew where stations were going to go, we didn't have any of that. We didn't even know if we, the money we're getting would be sufficient. And on the floor of the Senate, on the second to the last day when they voted on this bill, folks like the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee said, City and County Honolulu, you asked for a full percentage, we're giving you a half a percent. You asked for a very long period of time, we're giving you 15 years only. If you need more, you come back when you know what it is you need. And we started designing the project after that. We wanted to build what was called a locally preferred alternative for us local folks, which is a 26 mile system from downtown Kapolei up to Manoa. But by the time we designed it, we started crunching the numbers, we saw that we could not build the locally preferred alternative. We could only build what's called the minimum operation operating segment. And that's the 20 miles that we're building today. That's what we could do with the money that we had. And things were looking pretty darn good until this past month, this past summer, in August, when the first bid came out, I think, since I became mayor. No bids had been issued prior to my becoming mayor, but we were very concerned about the increasing construction market on this island. As mayor, you know, I approve a lot of different construction projects around the place, and we were hearing from folks that construction costs are going up. In my first year of mayor, three to five percent. In my second year, Eight to ten percent. And Dan Grabowskis and I, we meet every Thursday. We talk about construction increases and 
our concern that maybe there wouldn't be sufficient funds to build the first 20 miles. And so when the bid was opened in August, the low bid was 63% higher than our anticipated budget, and the high bid was 150%. We didn't want to issue any of the bids. We had to fight for a while with the low bidder before they, that was resolved, and then legally we could start slicing and dicing those bids to figure out why it was so high. And Dr. Balsas will talk about what he found out. We found out a bunch of things to try to bring down the prices, and the good news is that the recently reissued bid for just three stations came in within the range that we anticipated and better than under the initial bid that went out and was opened last August. We are in a hot construction market. The hottest in the country right now in terms of increased construction costs. New York is the highest in terms of construction costs. We're talking Manhattan. We're second. LA is third. But in terms of the increase in costs, we top everyone. One way that's a good thing, our unemployment is some of the lowest in the United States. City and County of Honolulu's unemployment rate covers between 3.5 and 4 percent. And most cities around this country wish and pray that they have our unemployment situation. We're putting our folks back to work. The bad news is we're competing for the same scarce resources and the same labor and prices that are going up. Transportation choices. I am passionate about transportation. I believe that to be a city that thrives in the 21st century on a small island of 640 square miles with almost a million people, we're 8,000 short of a million, with more coming. We need to make a better use of the land that we have. I do not want to be, I do not want to build, and I repeat, I do not want to build another freeway on this island or another major road. And I don't want to develop upper ridges or further out to our outside of our urban growth boundary. I want to make better use of the lands that are either zoned to urban or designated to be zoned to urban so we live better in the urban core on the South Shore. And the only way we can do that is by having multimodal transportation. That's rail, that's roads, that's bike lanes, that's sidewalks, and that's bus. Giving people a choice to get out of their car when there's gridlock and travel a different way is what responsible cities and leaders do around the world. I've never promised that rail is going to reduce congestion. And every city in the world that has rail still has congestion, but they got a choice. Can you imagine Manhattan without the subway? Can you imagine San Francisco with BART, without BART? People change how they travel when you give them choices to get out of their car. And I don't want to be car dependent going forward. And I think it's going to be better for all of us. So we made a commitment. Before I became involved in politics, even before I started working back in the 70s, they developed a general growth plan under Governor Ariyoshi, the plan for future growth. The second city at one point was going to be out on the windward side, in Ka'au. They talked about Kaneohe, they talked about Kaibu. They were going to punch a freeway through the back of Manoa Valley, where I live, for the second city. And then the decision was made to grow on the Eva Plain, where the land is flatter, and create a second city. But they didn't create any other alternative than one freeway. So we made a commitment to the folks on the west side where the growth was going to occur, which by 20, 30, 70 percent of all growth on this island is going to occur out there. And a lot is happening. And so we made a commitment to provide a choice to get out of the car and travel by rail. And I want to honor that commitment. Otherwise, I believe we're committing political malpractice. But we also made a commitment to the people of this island to give them a choice to live better in the 21st century and going forward. And I'm honoring that commitment. It's about multimodal transportation all linked together so we can travel and live better. And I think as the mayor of this city and county, I am not proud of the fact that we rank either one or two in the nation for the worst traffic congestion. It's LA and us trading each other year one is worse than the other. And I don't think anyone in this room wants to say, yes, our capital city, the most congested city in the country, we're proud. We don't want that. We want to help people travel better and live better. That's the commitment we made. Now, I'm going to turn over the microphone to Dan Grabowskis with the permission of these folks in a minute. But oversight. I am absolutely 100% committed to providing as much oversight and transparency on both good and bad news. And I think we have not done a good enough job to provide the information that you all demand. That doesn't mean it's not there. 
If you go to, what is your website, Ben? HonoluTransit.org, you'll find thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pages of documents. And hardcore minis are open under Sunshine Laws every month. And the press is there many times covering those meetings. They have, we have press conferences, they go out to neighborhood boards. They're audited by the Federal Transit Administration because they invested $1.55 billion. For that investment, they want to make sure they're getting their money's worth. And so they hire third-party auditors like government folks to audit hard, and they report those findings. But obviously, it hasn't gotten out to all of you in a way that you can understand. I mean, even with the legislature, in the past two months, we provided thousands of pages of documents that are here at the request of the Ways and Means and Finance Committee and additional information provided by heart. And there's much more that needs to come. I'm in favor of a state audit. I'm in favor of ad quarterly reports at, a, at the legislature with, in a public setting so hard questions can be asked. I'm in favor of whatever is needed to provide you the information you need, that we're doing everything possible to control our costs and to finish the project as promised to you. 20 miles, 21 stations, 80 cars. And if I have it my way, and I'm hoping you will support the request to take it up to Manoa, not over the freeway, not under the freeway, but stopping by Pucks Alley and creating a true college town for our community and for our residents. That's my dream. People say it should go out to Manoa. It's crazy it doesn't, and I think we should honor the locally preferred alternative. With that, I'm going to turn it over. Scott, should I give it to Dan, or do you want me to turn it back to you? Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to Dan Grabowskis. As some of you may know, Dan comes from the state of Massachusetts, one of the first states in the country to build the first rail system in the country to beat out New York. They're both racing, racing to get a system built. When it was first built, the MBTA, the T as they call it, went eight tenths of a mile from one end of the Boston Common to the other. And now it's 800 miles in count. Continues to grow to this day. I went to college and graduate school in Boston. A kid from Hilo rode on a system that was built way before we became a state, way before people thought of Hawaii as a significant place. And yet, people like me from Hilo can use that system I did every day because I couldn't afford a car. It was very, very easy to get around Boston. But now I want to turn it over to Dan Grabowski, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. that's currently taking place, in case you don't head out to West Colorado, so you can see the progress that we've been making on the project. So the first question that I get most frequently is, it seemed that up until last year, the project was moving forward very well. We had had challenges in the past with lawsuits, we had halts of our construction, but by and large, the budget and the schedule seemed to be holding. So what happened? Well, there were really just the three things that came together last year that put us in the situation that we are today. The first is if you would watch the budget at heart over the last several years, you would have seen that the, the general excise tax that had been coming to the to heart um, to fund the project had been lagging a little bit from behind what we had in our plan. What that meant was is that we had a projection for how much we would get from the GPT, but that that projection was falling short. And up to last year, it was the 20 to 30 million dollar range. And if you and I had stopped and talked in the street corner and you'd said, Dan, that seems like a lot of money, I would have been able to tell you, you know, we have a very healthy contingency over almost 600 million dollars at that time. And then 
40 million, 30 to $40 million dollars is not something that we couldn't handle. But it was something that was taking money away from our budget. The other thing that would have happened um, late last year, if we were talking, is you would have seen that there were a number of change orders that were being brought to the uh, heart board to deal with delay claims. And the delays were caused for two reasons. One was that a number of contracts went out back in 2009 and 2010. And those contracts were given to Kiwit um, as the company doing the work, but we were not able at the time, the city was not able at the time, to give them the okay to move forward. So under the contract, they had hired people, they had hired equipment, they had uh, leased office space, and they had claims against the project. And we had to pay those until we were able to give them the okay to start work, which they did in April of 2012. No sooner had we started work than the state Supreme Court ruled against the project, and we had to stop construction for another 13 months. And we had mobilized lots of people, lots of equipment. And that also cost us delays. So we spent the next two years negotiating those claims, but they totaled up to about $170, $180 million. And that didn't buy us a single rail car or a single column. And I'm not going to money more than quarterback decisions that were made in the past. It just is what it is that that money has had to be spent for delay claims. And again, if you would stop me on the street corner and said, Dan, that seems like an awful lot of money, I would have told you, we still think we can handle that because we have a very healthy contingency, over $600 million. But as the mayor pointed out, the game changer for us took place last August when we opened the bids for the nine stations that cover the first 10 miles of the project. Those bids, as the mayor mentioned, and I won't go through all the details, came in very, very much higher. We canceled the bid, we explored with the companies and construction companies why they came in so high. And what we realized is that while the first 60% of the construction contracts that are currently underway, we're going to be able to fund and we'll be able to handle them with the budget that we have. The future contracts for the remaining 10 miles of the guideway and the 21 stations, we're, we're going to come in higher than what we thought, probably up to 45% higher. And that's when we said that the projected increase in our cost was going to be in the five to seven hundred million dollar range. It's about 10 to 12 percent over the budget. So when you bring those three things together, then I would have stopped on the street corner and talked to you and said, now we have a problem with those three things together. And then, then the legislature, um, I'm sorry, then the city council and the mayor, realizing this in the last couple of months, said to us, you know, we also had bus money that we put into the project to fund it that we never wanted you to use. And you know what? We don't want you to use that. And that was $210 million that was supposed to come into the project to fund it. And the decision was made by the city council and the mayor, as long as you've got to solve the problem for the delay claims, for the GT falling short, and for these new prices, we want you to also solve the problem of keeping the bus money going to us. And that, that's the $910 million we're talking about. So as I've been asking them this evening, you know, are we, are we already in deficit? No, the answer is we are not. What we're projecting, however, is that the costs for the remaining contracts are going to exceed the budget we have. And that's why we're having this public conversation about, um, about having to fund this deficit. And I'm happy to answer more questions about it when we do the Q&A. What I'm going to do just with a couple minutes is left is just ask you to take a look over here. Um, one of the things you do need to know is that the project is moving forward very quickly and doing very, very well. And you know the project that's 20 miles, 21 stations, uh, from East Couple A all the way into Alamoana Shopping Center. And today we're doing all of our work um, primarily out here in the first 10 miles. So here's a photograph of the first two and a half miles. This is an aerial photograph of the guideway. So this is actually heading from East Couple A, heading west. Again, just another picture up there. You can see <coughs> heading towards my bottle. Here's a photograph of the guideway where we're actually already putting track on top. This is out there where the Opioli station will be. Just another picture of the guideway. And then next to Leeward Community College and Waipapu High School is the 43 acre site where all the trains will go in the evening to be cleaned, to be maintained, um, where the operations uh, control center will be located. That's where the trains will all be centrally controlled. If you don't know it, we're building the first 
fully automated driverless system in the United States. It will be about the 25th such system in the, country, in the world, but we'll be introducing a new technology. And from this building here, um, you'll actually see all of the controls for the entire system. This, this, area, this area here is the 43 acre site. And what you're seeing here in the gray is the first of the ballast or the, the stone that goes down when you put down track. And you can see some of that taking place here alongside the main uh, building where trains will go in and out of here for maintenance and this is where administration will be. Here you can just see track being laid out at the, at the uh, rail yard. And then you're seeing a lot of these large segments going up. And this is the precast yard in Kalailoa. All these little segments here that you see are actually these 50 ton segments. There's about 12 of them that comprise a span between one column and the next. And finally, if you go out to the H1 and H2 merge right now, you see an awful lot of construction um, and what we call the balanced cantilever. So this is where we're actually crossing the H1 and H2, and we're build, building the span across this direction um, and back this way towards the Community College, and this way um, over towards our St. Clair. So the project itself, again, you know, is 20 miles, 21 stations. This is just some operating details. We'll operate, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that you may have. And now I'll just leave this slide up, which is, um, as the mayor mentioned, we have a tremendous amount of information on the project that we want to share with you. It's available uh, on our website, and you can connect with us directly, and that's how to do it. So with that, I'll just say uh, thank you, and we'll be happy to uh, think up there and take your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank, you thank you, Dan. So now we'll watch the Q&A, both on the mayor and Dan will be taking questions. We have two questions for the mayor, um, and I think you answered one of them. The first one is, don't you think um, an audit of part should be performed before committing more of our dollars to grant? As I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm in favor of, of any further audits that, that mm -hmm. need to be done. But I think that um, we don't need to delay extending the authority to the city kind of Honolulu because audits have been done, and I would encourage people to look at the audits that have been done, um, and Dan may even expand what the most recent one is, to go look at seeing what they've done. Now, these are independent third-party audits by the Federal Transit Administration. They hire a company called Jacobs Engineering. It's one of the largest engineering companies in the country. And they come in and do these audits periodically for heart, but maybe you could expand on that. That's okay. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, uh, because we take federal money, we are very uh, much under uh, public scrutiny. Um, the accountability of the project is actually very high. We have, um, as the mayor mentioned, the Federal Transit Administration. They come in every month for a couple of days. They look at our management and our financial situation. Um, they also hire independent firm that comes in on a monthly basis to review all that. On a quarterly basis, I meet with uh, the Federal Transit Administration, uh, either, uh, either the folks in San Francisco or Washington, D.C. will come to Honolulu, um, and we also, uh, sorry about that, um, and there are, they also wanted us. In addition, um, we have oversight from our heart board of directors, we have an audit committee, and independently, a financial auditor comes in once a year to um, review Hart's uh, books, just like any other public entity, uh, which we also have. Um, and in addition, we also are subject to audits from the um, city county uh, auditor, as well as a number of other entities. So, uh, can they find these audits? You can find them at our website, the website on lowtransit.org. Um, all of the audits and monthly reports are all located there. Um, we make presentations to our Hart board and to the media and at various public events. And you can get a look at that, and there's uh, basically one report per month going back to the beginning of the project, um, when we became a federal aid project, and they've tracked this all through, all throughout. So I, I don't know if that person had their question answered, but I guess there, there's legislation going through um, asking for an honor, but I don't know if that person had their question answered. 
can we can we have people actually come up to a microphone and ask the question? It's a town it's a town hall meeting. I've never seen a town hall meeting where the questions are edited by a group of politicians. Can we have can we have people ask the question? Well, some people don't want to come up to a microphone. Let's have the people that want to come up to a microphone come up to a microphone. This ain't this ain't a town hall meeting. This is a public relations event. Right. You know. You're right. Yeah, I heard the right. Well, I you know I'm just saying what people are thinking. Don't you think an audit of art should be performed before committing more of our dollars to grant? I don't know whether you answered. So I answered. I don't think it's necessarily for you to extend the authority because there have been many audits as Dan has described and look at those audits. But as I say, audits, I'm not against having further audits being done. In fact, whether it be on a quarterly or an annual basis and those to be reported too. But I do think there is sufficient information available for the decision makers to make a decision about giving the city company the authority to extend the tax. So you That's my answer. The audit should be performed before committing more of our dollars to Correct. Mr. Mayor, I am a Kiowa resident and freshman at UH Manoa. I was too young to vote for or against Braille in the referendum, and yet you plan to raise taxes on me and other middle class citizens for the project. Why do you think this failed and expensive project is de deserving of my hard earned money? Shouldn't we have the question of a tax extension on the ballot, or at the very least, debated under a special session of the legislature? So I believe in uh, the legislative process, and I think there is a, a very extensive debate going at the legislature. I have appeared before various committees. If you added it all up, probably 20 hours at this point, just me alone and many others, including Dad, have appeared. There's been a lot of hard questions to ask. I think the legislature has done a thorough, thorough job of asking those questions. There are further hearings. They've demanded a lot of information which has been provided to the legislature and is available to the public. So I believe in the legislative process. Um, there was a referendum in 2008 on rail. It passed. Um, I don't think we have to have multiple referendums on rail. I think the people have spoken and we're building the system that they voted on, the 20 miles. So I understand the process. I think there is a political process in place. I support 100% the legislative process that's ongoing. So do you think the an expensive project is deserving of my hard money. Well, one, I don't believe that's a failed project. Um, I believe it is an expensive project at 5.2 billion, and if you add another 900 million to that, yes, it's expensive. No one said it wasn't going to be, but it's, I think, a much better project to build than another freeway. And I think once built, it's going to serve the generation that she's talking about, young folks who can't afford a car in our island. The owner of a car spent about $14,000 a year between paying on the promissory note, paying for fuel, getting a license, getting insurance, and everything else. And we are a car crazy community. We have over 900,000 cars registered on this island alone. We don't need more cars. And I think the people of her generation are all electing not to buy as many cars and to travel through mass transit. So I think we're doing exactly what this young woman is saying we need to do in terms of living better. Okay, thank you. Those are the two questions that I have. So, what do we, where's the microphones? Okay, so who else to ask the question to the Mujiz Thank you. The middle of the room. Thank you. thank you so much for having this town meeting on the real project. It's about time, actually. I got zillions of questions. You said that we voted on this project in a referendum. I was part of a group back in 2008 that petitioned the city to put out initiative on the project. And it was to stop the real project. Number one, the people didn't have a chance to even vote on the alternative. You guys shut us down. You said you want to have steel on steel at the other we didn't have a chance to vote on the possibility of using the bus or using the hot wings 
or many different alternatives to that turns out to be a better alternative to get rid of traffic congestion than the town rail. We know that after the rail is built in 2020, the traffic in Leeward and Central Africa is going to be 30 times worse than the traffic today. And you can sit there and tell us, you can shove it down our throat because this is what we voted for. I don't like to call you a liar here, but I think you're pretty close to misjudging the facts. Well, if I could just respond as you heard me in my hearing. Every city with rail has, let me finish. I said that every city with rail has congestion. But what you may fail to understand is with rail, there will be 40,000 fewer cars in 2030 than there would otherwise be. But there will be more, there will be more congestion because more people live here. As far as referendum 2008, did you vote up on it, sir? Did you vote up for rail in 2008? No. So you had a vote, and you voted no. And if the majority would have voted with you, we wouldn't be building this system today. So I beg to differ that there was no vote put before the people. That vote was not a vote that should have been on the ballot. The vote that should have been on the ballot was the initiative that said we should stop rail. That was supposed to have been on the ballot, but and I think you were there at the time when... A vote, no, a vote no would have been an initiative to stop rail. No, no, that's what they thought. We were stopped. Our petition drive was three months old. And we were stopped by the city clerk. We were told to stop this because we weren't permitted on the ballot. This is a, a vote by the people. We had enough voters to be on the ballot box. Because of the problems we were not allowed. The other thing you mentioned was that you said that after rail is constructed, we're gonna, it's going to put 40,000 cars out of the misspoke rides. Right. Well, there's a big difference between cars and rides. Because according to Thomas Carpenter's, there's about 4 million rides per day using cars. So if you take up 40,000 rides, you're taking out 1% of the, the people that would Cars. That's all it is, 1%. The problem with statistics is they don't tell the full story. As everybody here knows, when, when because saying 1%, 2% doesn't really tell somebody. When school's out at UH and private schools, we all know that the H1 operates quite a bit differently. In fact, fairly well during the summer months. And you all know that when they have the beat the school jam to remind us that school's coming back, they remind us that about 43,000 cars that weren't on the streets for the summer are now coming back to the streets and the highways. And what you need to understand about um, the way that traffic congestion operates, it, it actually operates like water and pipe. You don't need to remove 50% of the water to make the fluid dynamics to make the pipe actually operate. You need to reduce enough in the right places so that the congestion is mitigated. And so, just like everybody here knows, like I said, when you age is out, each one actually works okay, the streets aren't so congested. That's 43,000 vehicles today. Now imagine if in the future we reduce the congestion by those 40,000 40, trips, and in the summertime you have to reach out. Think of that, that's the, that's the impact that people will feel. And the system that we're building, sir, you should know, is actually scalable. In other words, it would allow us, if this is a success, without having to change the size of the stations or the length of the platforms, be able to add up to 80 more rail cars. We could actually go from that 40,000 to 80,000 trips simply by buying more rail cars. That's absolutely and, not true. Okay, let's let them speak, please. All right. And so you can have your turn. And so the, so the system, I believe, mean, will have a very positive impact. And I think you can see that even just from that, that statistic that I just thought of saying. Okay, sir, we want to start. Can we have there are other people with questions? If you want to have a question for the microphone, please go into the middle of the room and form a line. We kind of want, there's a lot of questions. We want to limit them to one per person at this point. We have a lot of questions over here as well, or some questions. Okay, my name is Kiwan. All I'm saying right now, according to what the head just said, 
you're going to be in very big trouble with all the car companies that we have that sell in cars because you say that nobody could be buying cars anymore. Hello? Something's wrong with that picture. Um, you may have seen some of the questions I've put out uh, regarding inconsistencies in the reports that you've um, given to various parties, and I hope that will be addressed this week during all the meetings that we have coming up on Heart and Real um, at City Council and State. But my question for you tonight is regarding the state administrative fee, and um, I understand that Kobayashi's point about that, that when the state agreement came through, the city agreed that there would be a 10% administrative fee to cover the administration of the surcharge. Now, for whatever reason, that fee was estimated to be too high. And what we found out recently is that the Oahu taxpayers are coming, covering 85% of the operating costs to run the Department of Taxation. This is clearly outrageous. And so, the proposal was made by the House to reduce that fee to 3%. The State Department of Tax has estimated that if the, the fee were reduced to 3%, effective July through the end of 2022, the city would have $119 million more. And that would about cover more than half of the bus funds. My question for you then is, Dan, why is Hart only supporting the intent and Mr. Mayor, why is the city not taking a position on that? Because my position is that is the right thing for everybody to do. It benefits the taxpayers and the property. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, 
I'll tell you what political malpractice is. It's raising taxes after irresponsible management of this failed project.
to deal with rail. When my father was still alive, there was already a rail system already on this island operating. And, and, and of course, too, I can explain to the you, Mr. Mayor, the third mayor, not the other from before. But, uh, I don't think it is the right thing to say nobody's going to use this rail. I believe that I'm more in favor of the, of the bus system, but I figured that this bus system can be tied in, uh, tied, tied in into the rail system as a, as a for uh, cooperation you can use uh, transportation system. I just want to know from you, how do you feel about, about putting the bus system to the light like, rail system, to the rail system or what is it going to be a light rail system? How are you going to put those two things together if, you, if there is a way of doing it? Thank you. Um, Clifton, thanks for your question. I think if, if you're asking on uh, bus rail integration, uh, we have formed a working group between HART, which is rail, and OTS, which is bus. Uh, Mike Formby, who's here, the Director of Transportation Services, might just stand up and wave your hand, so if you want to talk to him afterwards, he is actually working on bringing an integration between bus and rail, because it's not bus versus rail, or rail versus <coughs> bus. And what we started to plan is, for example, we're going to have a uniform fare card, or we call it tap cards, so whether you ride a bus or a rail, it would be the same card and it'd be seamless, so you could transfer one to another very easily. And then we're making sure that the routes for bus are integrated with the rail station stops. So we have fewer long haul buses and more short haul coming in from subdivision and suburbs connecting to the rail station so people can ride to get into work and back home again. But we're also looking at bike. We're gonna, you're gonna be able to bring your bike on the train and get off the train and ride your bike to work. It would be a shorter ride if you're coming in from, you know, out of the Eva plane. So it, we're looking to integrate and make it easy and seamless for people to use the different forms of transportation through our multimodal efforts. Thank you. Next question, please. My name is Dave Smith. I'm retired from the Board of Engineers. I understand the problems that you're going through on getting this thing done on the budget because the budgets always escalate. But that's not an excuse. First thing I'd like to do is I want, want to thank Ann Kobayashi for asking the right questions in the city council. Right now, as a part of this project, 20 miles, 
will be about 4,300 spaces that will be built. As to your question, I, I wanted to add to what Dan said about parking. The other thing the city is doing that we're, we're tasked with doing is, is developing around a, trans, uh, around a rail station called TOD or Transit Oriented Development. And part of that is we're incentivizing the private sector to one, build affordable housing, two, true workforce housing where you don't need a car so you save money and can plow it back towards rent, but also encourage people to build additional parking for users of the rail system so we don't pay for it, the, people, the taxpayers don't pay for it, the private sector does. As to your question, yes, I sit in debates on time and on budget because I believe it would be on time and on budget. I was incorrect in believing it was going to be on budget. I'm here to tell you that. I'm not running from it or hiding from it. And I'm out publicly asking for the authority to extend the tax so we can complete the 20 mile system that we committed to the people of the summit. Well, one question there. Did I understand you in the last, the last question? You said you were in favor of the legislative process mentioned recall. Is that a fact? No. You said, I recall. Does that mean you're in favor of recall? <laughs> no, I'm not. I said I'm in favor of the legislative we're process. In favor of recall. Okay. Here you go. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cynthia Frith and I live in Kailua and I'm as concerned about this rail as I could be no matter where I live on the island. We're all paying for it. My first question is for the mayor. Um, I'm really wondering why you would choose the most aggressive tax possible to hook or hinge your funding of this rail. You hurt the poorest people on the island. There are about 30% of the people that make $50,000 or less, almost 30%. They are really, really hit by the get tax. You double that get tax, you extend it, you're going to have more and more people that slip over the edge. You think we have a problem with homelessness now? That can be a serious, serious incentive for more and more to become homeless. Now, I know you did it. I'm asking why you did it as opposed to going after property taxes right on the top. So to answer your question, I'm, I'm in favor of the, collecting the, the sums the sum that we need through the GT, just like we have already <laughs> authorized to us until 2022, and everyone is paying that until 2022. It's because one third of it, one third of it is not paid by residents. They're paid by visitors in the military. And I know there's, agree there's disagreement, this has been raised in testimony, but we have continuously shown, and it has been supported by government, by the Department of Taxation, State Department of Taxation, that our figures are correct, that when you add both visitor industry and the military, it's about 38% is paid by others than people on this island. Real property taxes are paid by all of us. Every single person in this room pays real property taxes. Now, yes, they'll say tourists pay for resort, real property taxes, and the rest, but not to the level, nowhere even close to the level that the GET is paid for by our visitors. And so as mayor, if I have a choice to export the tax burden offshore at 38%, I choose that to taxing everyone on this island. I'm against raising real property taxes. We right now are seeing our assessed values going up because of the strong real estate market, and on top of that, if you're suggesting that I go and raise real property taxes rate on top of excess values, I'm not for that. Now, maybe you're in favor of it, but I think most people in this room are not. In response, in response sir, I differ very strongly with your numbers. The percentage of people paying the get, get tax um, that are outside of the common lines of the, of the uh, island, are nowhere near 38 percent. That figure is simply not correct. Secondly, well, then we'll respectfully disagree because I believe the numbers provided by the State Department of Taxation. Secondly, secondly, eventually, with the cost of this rail going up as rapidly as it is, we're at six billion and counting. The estimates from the EIS back in 2008 said that the 
most conservative cost for this rail would be nine billion plus. It could go as high as 14 billion plus. That's what it said. And, and beyond that, you're now talking about adding, you, you, the, you, you created, you created a financial problem here with a six billion plus price tag now. And you've only done a little over two miles. What's going to happen to the cost going up all the way in through the city and so forth? They're probably going to skyrocket. A lot of change orders, et cetera. So we know at some point in time they're going to come after our property taxes. My question was, why would you put such a burden on the poorest people in, on the island? Normal, regular, hardworking people with this debt tax. And then want to extend it for 25 years. Where is the sense in that? That's my question. I appreciate it. I think I answered the question, and I take your comments, and I answer the question, why I support the GET is because 30% of it is paid by people who don't live here. I don't want to put the burden on those who live here. If I can get more than a third paid by others, I believe that is a better choice to make. And that's my answer to your question. I'm sorry if you don't like my answer. But it is the one I'm answering honestly what you asked me. That's why I favor okay, the GET. Okay, okay, that's fine. Thank we you. will agree to disagree. I think I'm going to disagree a little bit more strongly than you want. My second question to with the transit-oriented development going along every single station, develop, 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 there's no way that all of these people aren't going to have cars. Cars are in, they're it. Now they may use the train from time to time, but how many people, even if only a third of the people buy cars, are going to have hundreds of thousands more people on the island? You're going to take that amount of transportation right back up on the freeways. They're, they can't take their car on rail. They have lots of other stops to make all around the island. How is this really going to cut down on congestion? Which all the studies say it will not cut down. Um, the traffic will be worse in 2030 with the rail than it is right now. It will be worse because of our growing population and number of vehicles, but it would be worse, even more worse, uh, than if we didn't have a rail as an alternative. You actually answered your own question sort of embedded in the way you phrased it. Um, there will be people who will, time to time, who live along the corridor, who will be living in these transit oriented development um, communities, who will opt to take the train because they can get them from one place that they are to the place they want to go to and get back without having to get in the car. And what we do is we study that in our environmental uh, review, and what we realize is that even before you change travel patterns by changing growth patterns, so that's putting workforce housing near the stations, we're going to take 40,000 vehicles off the road. We're going to take about 120,000 trips that are done every day, um, that will be done on, on board the rail, on board the full operation. And so it isn't for everybody, but it will be beneficial for those who are certainly who are on the train who can go from one end of the island to the other here in this, 40, in this 20 miles of 42 minutes. And it will also be a benefit for the folks who are left on the road because that car that would have been there isn't there because someone was able to take that trip from, say, you know, um, Pearl City to Alamona Shopping Center and then come back and not have to get into their uh, car. So it isn't for everyone and it isn't for every trip. But it's, it should be enough trips that will have a very great benefit. And as we build out the transit point of development along the, the railroad, what the city's planning for, and you'll see this in other cities, is it's not just, you know, right now we have housing in one place, factories or businesses in another place, uh, so you use shopping in another. What the goal is, is to have basically what I, what I need to be called um, sort of urban villages within the city where people can live and work and uh, recreate and go to places of worship all in the same area around these stations so they can use uh, the rail in that fashion. And it tends to compact growth and not have it spread or sprawl to like other parts like the Windward Side and East, uh, east Law. So that's that's sort of the, uh, the reason why you're able to have the benefit. Well, I thoroughly understand the, the uh, concept. Yeah. I'm going to move on now. Oh, no. okay.
Yeah. I, I thoroughly understand the concept. Um, I don't think it's going to work. It hasn't worked in many, many places. It's too expensive. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do we have we have about 50 written words and questions up here, so I want to do some rapid fire questions right now before we get to the next um, person. No, I'm okay with that. Why does it real good wait? Why does it real go to wait? The current pro uh, project began by the Mall Shopping Center to East Top Lake. What was originally studied back about a decade ago was a, a, a system that was a, about 27 miles long. It actually went all the way from downtown Copper Lane to the East Top Lane in the west. And in the east, it went from UH to Manoa and then it spurred to Waikiki. Um, as the mayor mentioned in his story at the very beginning, um, first we came up with the funding, and then we went locally. And then we went to the federal government, and they determined that they would be willing to give us about 30% of our project budget, which is the $1.55 million they're contributing. When we took the money that was estimated to come in from the GET until 2022, plus the $1.5 billion from the federal government, we came up with a cost estimate for the rail at that time. And that required of us to shrink the project from 27 miles to 20 miles. So there, are, there actually has been some uh, preliminary uh, engineering looking at going all the way to UH or into downtown Kapolei or even to Waikiki. But because right now I know, I know the city can speak of this more eloquently, but I know that the business community in Waikiki and the Department of Transportation Services are working very closely with um, shuttle buses and uh, uh, reconfiguring the bus routes so that folks can, when we build this system from Alamoana, can get to downtown Waikiki in a circulated bus system. So, Judge Bloody, uh, if you ask me, I'm not in favor of taking rail into Waikiki. I think Don Cohio is going to. It's going to be very difficult, but I do believe the circulator bus system that Mike Formby is working on with the visitor industry is going to make the difference to get people from Alabama into Waikiki to their hotels and workers also into Waikiki and back home again. I think we should try that first and see how it works before we talk about taking a spur into Waikiki. Okay, one more fast question. Can cost overruns be paid for by increases in property tax for we um, are looking, we're looking to put a, a task force together to look at that. Uh, we are talking about um, creating a, what they call a tax increment financing around rail projects so if values go up, we could get the increased tax and use it to plow back into ex extensions or building affordable housing. It's something other communities have done in other parts of the world and we'll be looking at doing the same. Similar question, why can't we tax the developers who will be making huge profits from their rail developments rather than extending the excess tax? Good question. Um, yeah. Long term, through tax increment financing, we'll be doing that. But short term, this increase in value doesn't happen just because you say they're building rail. It happens over 5, 10, 15, 20 years as the project is completed and development occurs. And we will use that money to, through tax increment financing to help either build spurs or do operation and maintenance of the system. But it's, we need the money now. In fact, in order to issue all the contracts to finish our project by the first quarter of 2020, we gotta get every contract out on the street this year and the first quarter of next year. The money taxing developers, the value hasn't occurred yet, but it will down the road. And yes, we would be looking to recapture that value. Can we take a question?
the taxes is ridiculous. Just like so many percent goes every bracket. Last year when I was buying my bill, it was only 450. Today it's 650. The pineapple used to be $1.99 or so. Now it's $2.99. And the taxes keep adding on to the prices. So we need to stop the real now and the homeless. Some of those money can use for the homeless. Get them off the street. Yeah. And get good health programs for them. I know a lot of them on the drugs, but it ain't all for That's the choice. That's why they in that, in that hole. So if you folks stop the real now, what is the cost now? And we take the loss. So your question I hear, sir, is you know, why do we stop the rail now and what does it cost if we do so? I'm going to answer it briefly and I'm going to ask Dan Vasquez to expand them. So in exchange for getting $1.55 billion from the federal government, we have to sign a legal contract called the Full Funding Grant Agreement that obligates the city to do certain things. It obligates us to build a 20-mile system with 21 stations and with 80 cars. And in the contract itself, it says that it, should we stop and not build the system that we promised in exchange for their investing in the project, that we need to return the money that they've given to us, and then we have to look at the system that we built and tear it down. And when you put all of that together, it totals billions of dollars. And we go right back to where we were before, with the same bad traffic ranking first or second in the United States, with no alternative than the status quo in an island that's even getting more populated because people keep moving here. As you heard people asking questions from all around the island, some of them moved here and that adds to the traffic congestion that we have and more keep coming because of our beauty and because of the diversity of our population. So stopping, in my mind, would be the worst thing to do because we pay money back, a lot of money, and we have no solution to our increasing traffic problem. But Dan, you may want to add to that. You know, if we make a lot of money for the rail, if we make cutoffs a little overpass, we can get rid of the traffic gridlock. And in Honolulu, there's too many left turns. Everywhere you go is left turn, left turn. And with the pedestrian crossing, only one or two cars can go by. So we need to get a better uh, solution for the traffic, uh, uh, traffic light to circularize it in the right way. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your concerns and we'll take it to heart and talk to Mike Formby about maybe some of your ideas. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. What else question to the What's the bill? How do we plan to maintain our bill system? I guess, how much will it cost and what will the process be? So the, uh, when the project will be project between 2020 and uh, fully operational, the system will actually be very efficient. As you know, today we have a really successful bus system, um, over 500 buses that operates with uh, over 1,800 employees. We're going to be able to uh, move all the folks on our system because it's a driverless system with fewer than 300 employees to run the entire thing. That's including mechanics, car cleaners, and, and everything. So um, one of the things that the studies that led us to this system uh, really showed us is that you really can't add more buses in some of the places where we need buses the most. You can't go onto King Street or North Hotel Street and add more buses. So the rail is really part of the answer to do that. And it will move folks at about half the cost per mile than what it currently costs to move folks on, on, the, on a bus. So um, when, if you look to 2020, when we're in full operation, um, the total cost for the uh, operations will be about 110 <coughs> And if you assume that the uh, same rate of payment um, is the, you know, for rail is for the bus, right now if you ride the bus, you only pay about 30% of the cost for that trip. 70% is actually paid for uh, today by uh, city county revenues. If you, if you do the same kind of math, you'll be in the 70, 70 to $80 million range for a subsidy, and about um, uh, a, third, a third of the total cost will actually come from what you pay at the Uh, 
materials and where do you think prices are going in the future? What can we do to try to drive down costs by reducing your risk? And how, how much do you think we can take this 60% increase and bring it down? And they can be said maybe 35 to 45% over what your estimates are, but not much less than that because prices have just risen and will be rising in the next two years while we do construction. So we canceled that nine bid solicitation and we took just three of the nine stations we put it out to bid a few months ago. And what we said, we did everything that did, almost everything that did that the construction community um, said would reduce costs. And the good news is, is that when we opened those bids, they, came, they bid for three stations. While it was higher than what we originally estimated, it was less than what we had just done back in bids a few months before. And if we can continue to get these bids, as the mayor said, out right now as quickly as we can and lock in those prices over the next nine months or so, that's really when we're going to be able to be predictable with what the cost will be in the future. And so um, that's what we're shooting for, and that's one of the reasons why, um, while we're not, we're not in a situation where we've gone over our budget, but we're projecting that we could, time really is of the essence, time is money, so the quicker we can get this out, the, the, the most we can do. To your second question, uh, the mayor sort of already alluded to the question about the, the number of stations and could we cut those stations. I'd say two things, first of all, the, there was a long community process that selected the route for the rail and the number of stations and the locations. It was in long before I got here. It was many years of, of consultation with the community that selected those sites. Um, and so there is a commitment to fulfill that obligation. But maybe more recently, when the state and city and counties signed the full funding grant uh, agreement with the federal government to receive the federal money. Part of the commitment that the county and the city made was we will build 20 miles, the 21 stations that are outlined up there, and um, have 80 rail cars and operate every five minutes in the peak period and so on. So we made a commitment, we signed a contract to deliver that at this point. And so past decision making now is requiring us to build the system that, um, that we presented earlier. If I could just add one more thing. The stations are where they are in part. Um, to get maximum ridership. And so I agree with you, they're kind of close together in certain areas, but they're key places, right? Bishop Street is one place, a lot of people get off there to get to work. Chinatown is another, a lot of people go there to shop and, and do business. So they're staged, they're positioned where they are in consultation with the community and they encourage as much ridership as possible for the system. Okay, I have a quick question. The city charter only specifies a fixed guiding system why does the city insist that steel on steel is required? Please provide citations. I believe that it was in 2009, uh, 2010, I forget which, uh, that the question actually of the technology uh, was actually put to the voters, and it was, I believe, described in the vote as steel wheel on steel rail. And um, the community, we all at that time, we voted to have the steel wheel on steel rail. Again, I don't remember if it was 2009 or 10. Okay, one more quick question, then we'll go back to the audience. Why not tax REITs? Alamana REIT, for example, pay zero tax. Please explain why REITs billions are not being taxed. Are you talking about, I don't know, is this REITs? REITs it's yeah. something that's before your legislative body. We don't have control over taxing and REITs. Um, I'd be open to getting more authority. <laughs> but it's something before the legislature that's better answered by the members of our panel. Mindset. That's still his mindset. Okay, so 
that's in, and I think that's good because it gives those of us that think there should be an alternative a, a, a little bit of a window to, to get our groups together and to offer an alternative. So I hope the governor will hold, hold fast with that. Councilwoman um, Kobayashi, uh, there's an issue still before the Ethics Committee on several of the uh, council members um, the situation, and that could be impactful as well. And I wondered if you have any update on the Ethics Committee with respect to the councilman that voted, and there may have been some ethics questions on you. Right. I, I don't know what the outcome of that is and whether it'll change votes. I have always voted against, so it doesn't change my vote at all. And those meals certainly didn't change my vote. So I don't know um, what has been decided, whether the Ethics Commission can decide that votes can be um, negated. So I haven't heard what the outcome is. Well, the, vote, the ethics committee did make a statement that they had the decision now within six months, and the possibility that votes can be returned is a possibility. Okay. But that's what the ethics committee That's exactly right. So that's still going back to my question to the representative psyche. That's another issue within that time frame of no compelling reason to pass it at this time. Um, we all agree that the GDP tax or the a regressive tax. A couple of people have talked about that. It is. No one is going to say it's not. The gentleman who was up here a moment ago at $24,000 going to the grocery, these people over here can help you with that by repealing the GDT tax on food. Okay? And if they do that, they can help all of us. Okay? So I, I, I know that may not be popular at that table, but taking tax off of food would be helpful to the folks that that he did mostly when they voted. Mr. Mayor, I, I, I apologize, and I'm going to keep this civil between you and I because I like you, but um, uh, two or three weeks ago in the newspaper. Last question, sir. Uh, I'm going to be quick, but it's not my last question. Okay? Uh, in the newspaper, you said uh, that the folks that think we should stop the rail, that that idea was stupid. Okay, now you may have been misquoted, but it was written in the paper. Now, where I grew up, when an idea was stupid, the person that originated the idea was also stupid. And I want you to know this is stupid. Okay? Because, and you can call me a Hollywood hobby when you see me stupid. I'll put that as a bad bottom. Okay? I really will. I, I, I agree with you all that the idea of the rail is a good idea, or uh, mass transit moving people is a good idea. I think Aloha, there's merit in stopping it, good merit. And stopping it at Aloha State. Yes. I really do. Okay? Yes. Uh, and I think you know, tonight there's the past to go there. Fifteen years ago, I personally saw a problem. What did I do? I went and found Chris Circle. Where's all my activity? I found a home in the middle of my activity. I parked my car. I ride the bus. If you took your ideas and your money and incentivized people to find the nucleus of that circle, Park cars, we we solve some traffic problems. It works in my life every single day beautifully. Those people that I know. Okay. Um, I, I just respond? I, I did. I appreciate it. I take your comment to heart about you know parking cars and finding that circle. I think what I said is I talked about three choices that we have. One was to raise the extend the GT, raise real property which I support, raise real property tax which I don't support, or stop. And I said, if we stop it, I believe that's crazy. I didn't say that someone who wants to stop it is stupid. I said, I believe it's crazy to stop and tear down what we have. I wasn't accusing anyone who supports that position of, of what you said. I never would have used that word, but I think I did say it would be crazy in my mind to do that. Okay? So, but I do, I do I respect your opinion. Thanks. I, I'll see you in the newspaper article so you can see it a little bit. Uh, final, final question is on the administrative
Department of Taxation's uh, estimate. And Mayor, is that your understanding too? That's my understanding too. Thank you very much. Okay, next rapid fire question. Um, it said that people will be able to take their bike on the train and have a tra train bike commute. Uh, don't you think we first need better bike routes or even bike routes at all? So what's happening with bike routes? Uh, I just mentioned the trains will have um, tracks. <coughs> when you come in uh, into the train, there'll be a four car train. And the two middle cars, there'll be uh, locations right inside the door where there'll be places where you can hang two bikes. Um, there'll also be areas within each of the four cars, um, either sort of open area, either for uh, wheelchairs, between strollers, um, or if you happen to have a, a bike. Ah, and we will, yes, we will have certain for that as well. Okay. But to get to your question on, on, on bike, as you know, I'm a strong supporter of protected bike lanes. I'm also a supporter of more bike lanes, and we are doing a lot with Mike Formby and the Department of Transportation Services Administration is committed to providing people more choice to ride safely around this community. But I also believe that choice involves being able to bring your bike on a train or on the bus. As you know, our buses are retrofitted to put bikes on it because some people are coming great distances and they cannot afford to ride from far away. But we want them to be able to ride once they get off at a bus stop and at a rail stop. So it's a combination of all those things and we're working hard to provide those choices. Next audience question. My name is Sean Popel. I'm an activist for this area. Um, you know, I haven't been real active for a number of years, but the one question that will probably, probably bring the problem to my attention is there's going to be a, a, quite a bit of uh, disruption and noise as the road is built in this area. What kind of steps the city can be taking to mitigate the disruption and noise that will inevitably happen from the structure? We've already begun uh, and have been for some time beginning with planning. Now that we know the route, um, we have maintenance and traffic planning that we do. Um, we plan for construction. So we work very closely on uh, HART, uh, the Department of Transportation Services, and also the uh, Hawaii DOT. Um, and we also work with uh, folks who will be doing construction in the private sector as well. So we'll, we'll coordinate all of our activities as best we can. The best thing we're finding is if we can get information hands so that they know when we may have lane closures, for instance, or uh, what the impacts might be, uh, so people can make plans to basically avoid the work uh, wherever possible. We're also doing a lot of the work in the evenings, um, so that uh, you see, if you head on to West Palm, that um, the work giving lane closures on page one or Manhattan Highway is primarily taking place at 8 or 9 p.m. until, say, 4 or 5 in the morning, uh, and we probably try to do the same thing city center area as well. And we do have requirements uh, for uh, noise in the evening work. Um, so we are required uh, not to um, go above a certain amount without a variance. And if there is a variance, that's a community meeting. So you have a chance to determine whether or not you'd rather see the work done during the day or in the evening. And if it's too noisy, it pushes back into the daylight hours. Thank you. Okay, I have a quick rapid fire question. Why was Ansaldo, Ansaldo contract terminated when he, and Hitachi hired? How much did Hart pay Ansaldo and for a job incompletely done? And how much did Hart pay Hitachi to finish it? Um, Ansaldo Rea is the company that's building our rail cars, and the sister company is called Ansaldo STS. They are still the company that is uh, building the rail cars and will operate the system. What you may have read in the newspaper is uh, that those two companies are owned by uh, an Italian company called Finn Mechanica. And that, that company that owns the other, that owns Ansaldo, um, has just sold the two other owners in the process of selling those two companies to Hitachi. Um, so there'll be no change for us. Um, Ansaldo Breda will still build the rail cars, and um, Ansaldo Joint Venture, those two companies, will still uh, build the system and operate us the uh, train cars. The only thing that's changed basically is the corporate ownership from an Italian uh, company to uh, uh, to be touched. Audience question. Thank you. My name is <clears throat> I have uh, I submitted a question uh, about the real estate investment trust, and I did that largely because I read an article in Civil Beat saying I believe there were 11 real estate investment trusts in the islands, uh, generating a profit of several billion or more. Uh, which is uh, sent offshore without paying any tax, zero tax. 
speak to is noise in the rail. According to the Hawaii Administrative Rules, Title II, Chapter 46, Community Noise Control. During the day, <coughs> residential areas are not supposed to exceed 55 decibels DBA uh, average, and at night, 45, otherwise it's harmful to your health. The recent uh, TOD environmental impact statement states that in the KCDD, traffic noise level associated with Nimitz Highway, Alamoana, King Street, Ward, Hickory, Punchbowl, Pensacola, South and Cook are typically greater than 65 decibels <coughs> along their ranks of way and due to the large volume of traffic on the thoroughfares. Uh, and then, then it gives a, a graph of, of, of the areas that are troubled. It says a level that generally exceeds 65 DBA are considered to be significant exposure, normally unacceptable to be developed as residential or multi-family use areas. Okay. Unacceptable means noise levels will have significant negative health impacts upon the population of those areas. Now this has been going on for years, and we know that there's no, uh, it's seemingly no attempt to regulate noise or, or to uh, have any mitigating factors and two blocks from Cockock or from Alamoana, and you can, at certain times, it's very difficult to cross it. So, um, I, think, I think this leads into the next part. The transit-oriented development study, which you use as the an environmental impact statement, says, and I quote, all units within 192 feet of either side of rail will require closure, air conditioning to be habitable. So if you, as the rail comes downtown, those units 192 feet or closer, who's going to pay for closing them, retrofitting them, and air conditioning them? Or what's, what, what are your plans? What, what are the same? It also concludes that this development, when it comes closer into town, when you build these nice buildings uh, adjacent to the rail, it will magnify the effect of the noise level an unspecified estimated number, but it would be significantly worse. So you're going to have more major thoroughfares coming in to feed into the rail centers, as you, as you said, uh, which will likely have, or perhaps will have, the same sort of uh, unmitigated noise levels that exist in the uh, it seems. Your, your, your question is very, very specific to, uh, and I'm not familiar with uh, the, the theory Maybe, maybe before the end of the evening, um, this, 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 trans, yeah. this is a transit-oriented development study, EIS, the, the latest one that just came out, which is certainly yeah. if, if, um, if section, section 4.8.2, existing conditions, paragraph 2. Uh, Again, your question is very specific. Maybe if I could ask um, one of the art staff just to, um, to get your questions and we'll follow up with you on that. understand that rail will have not had to mitigate any noise levels that are adjacent uh, to the rail beyond a certain distance. And after that, that burden of retrofitting all of these people's homes and buildings, if, if it in fact is done, will fall upon the state. And that could be, if it's not looked at, that could be a huge, unexpected, unplanned for, unbudgeted, significant effect. I'd be happy to it's Wednesday, April 1st, the Council Budget Committee and the City Council Special Meeting will take up whether the City will finance the real project with bonds guaranteed by our real property taxes. 1.9 billion in bonds will eventually be needed according to part. With all these money problems, if there is a default on money with the repaying of bonds, Will our taxes have to be raised? And if so, by what percent? So what um, the question you're asking is, uh, this memorandum understanding is going to be reviewed at, by the council on April 1st, Wednesday. Um, it's had, I think, multiple hearings and many questions asked. It came about at, at, the, at the request of the city council before I became mayor. They passed an 
an ordinance saying that before the city issues any bonds for rent, and none have been issued yet, we want to make sure that the city is protected and covered in the worst case scenario. And so we want you to develop a memorandum of understanding between HART and the city and county of Honolulu that protects the city's position to the best extent possible under the law. And so when I became mayor, we started to work on this process, negotiating long and hard with HART in an arm's length um, way to make sure that the city is protected. And then at this council's request, we submitted the MOU to the council for its approval. Through hard questions by HART, I mean by the city council, they have done additional amendments to our MOU, including some I think done by Councilwoman Ann Kobayashi, that I think make it even stronger. So I think this is a good agreement. It's one that I support because in the worst case scenario, we do have more ability and greater flexibility to protect protect the taxpayers of the city and county of Honolulu. So the question was, to that. question was, if there is default on the bonds, will our taxes, property taxes have to be raised? And if so, by what percent? That was the question. You know, I'm not assuming there's going to be a default. We're working hard to make sure that we have sufficient funds. That's why we're here tonight. We're talking about extending the excise tax. The council is going to be taking up that issue also on Wednesday. And therefore, I am assuming that we, we have sufficient funds to complete the 20 miles that we committed to. So there's no plan B if there is a default? I think that's I, what this is. Well, they may, I understand that. But I'm, you know, to, to say we're going to fail is something that I'm not saying we're going to do. We do have an excise tax that's continued to be collected till 2022, that, and the total sum is about $3.7 billion that could help cover that default, which I don't think is going to occur, but this revenue is continued to be collected that will be applied towards the project. But again, I want to emphasize that we're working as hard as possible to make sure we have the funds sufficient to build our 20 mile, 21 station, 80 car system that we promised and made commitments to the people of this island on. Thank you. Let's complete the audience question. Okay, um, I'm, my name is David Nash. I'm part of the McCulley and Wheeling Neighborhood Board. And I want to say I appreciate all our representatives for putting this meeting together so we can all better understand what's going on with the rail project. Um, I, I represent the silo majority that supports rail. We support a spine running from end to end on the island with the bus feeder systems that come down into a rail system so we can all get out of cars. I support protected bike lanes. I support the future of a West Palabu UH campus and our main campus here being in the same population but being able to go between the two. And that is the only way we're going to have a future for our island. My question to Dan is can we double down and spend more and get done quicker by bringing people in from off island? by renegotiating or offering incentives to our unions that are building the rail in order to get it done quicker. Because what I have heard is a bunch of belly aching. I have heard even substantive questions about how we can do this and how we can do this better, faster, and more quickly. I'll add one more. Sure. Uh, we, uh, I can tell you that we are, because of the earlier conversations about the longer we take and more it costs, we are trying to do this as quickly as possible. One of the constraints we've got is um, the fact that as it is right now, uh, at, at some point in the next couple of years, with all the contracts going out, over the full 20 miles and, and with the 21 stations, we'll have construction virtually at, at, at every mile. And so in order for us just to try to mitigate on the day-to-day -day activities for folks with traffic, and we're basically limiting ourselves a lot of the time in the evenings, um, there's only so, so fast we can go. Um, and this, and find workspaces. So our plan calls for us to build it as quickly as possible, which is why, um, again, thinking about this from 21, 20 miles, 21 stations, uh, by 2020, um, that's a lot of activity and a lot of work. And what's compounding our challenge is the fact that there's all this other private sector work is taking place as well. So not only is the mayor committed to repaving um, the popular roads uh, around the island, and H. Dot is very feverish in spending their money to fix and widen H. Dot. And so on. But you also have all this activity in Kakanako and stuff. So it's just a challenge to be able to try to do it you know, as quickly as we'd all like to see it done and just not have absolute real life um, across the island. Thank you. 
you didn't ask me this question, but if there's ways I can make it go faster, I want to make it go faster. And we, you know, we talk about this all the time with Art. And um, so I hear your sentiment, I want to do the same. If we go faster, it's not as expensive, and it's done. And then we can start writing. I hear you, I'm on board on doing that, however we can. Okay, thank you.
most number of rides was for the least dollars invested. And so the studies that were done indicated that the best route for us is the one that you saw there coming down um, Nimitz, Holly Kawila, and then moving onto Queen Street um, over to uh, Kona. We did, in fact, look at the Baratania Street alternative. Um, in fact, it was the subject of a federal lawsuit that also cost us money and time. And um, not only did we look at it, but a federal panel of uh, judges also looked at it and confirmed that the environmental studies we did showed that the Kaka'ako route is actually the better one for highest ridership at lowest cost. Do you realize that the Kaka'ako district was the immigration center for all the immigrants coming from the Far East and there were burials, you would find problems with the environment. But I know that construction is the engine that stimulates the economy. The tourism industry, I think, is the new plantation. Thank you. All the people that have come over from other countries are seeking a better life than where they came from. And that is the tourist industry, I believe, is the new plantation. So construction is the engine. However, we have to realize that the rail can be sent from the Evo Plains to Wyoming on a land rail system. Would that negate the $1.9 billion federal funds? If the, if the route is changed or the technology is changed, or if we change substantially anything about the project, we would have to go back to square one and do an environmental assessment once again. So at this point, for this project, you cannot change the technology or you couldn't change it from um, above grade, you know, or it's elevated to head grade. And, and I would just tell you that if your concern in Kaka'ako, for instance, is for um, uh, burials for EV, uh, one of the advantages of the project being elevated is that column footprint is about six feet wide, and you can move the columns, they're about every 125 feet. So in some cases where we found EV, um, when we did our archaeological inventory survey, we were actually able to go back to our engineering department and leave EV in place and just simply move the column. If you go at grade, you're going to have to excavate like a road down several feet and just go in these long 20 mile swaths, and you're digging up much more uh, land um, if you are that much greater than if you were um, above ground in here. Wasn't the rail supposed to alleviate the congestion on Kamehameha Highway from Waianae to Bethel Plains? The, the original rail route that was studied was from uh, downtown Kapolei, UH Manoa on the other far end. And so right now, this 20 mile project goes from East Kapolei uh, to Alamoana Shopping Center. It was never envisioned to go further uh, west to Waianae on uh, uh, what was studied for this project over the last, uh, say, 10 years or so. Okay, we, we have, you know, we reserved the capital trail until 7.45, so we need to, um, um, maybe just take one more question. Um, there's a lot of recent questions up here. Can we wrap up? Majority of your site, if you'd like, we need to stick around afterwards for individual questions for a while. Um, if that works for you guys. Um, can we submit the written questions as part for response on your website? Okay. All right, so one more question from the audience question. I, I hate to be up here again, like a uh, hogging the mic or anything, but I'm just so passionate about this, and so just first, I mean, uh, the gentleman who supposedly represented the silent majority, uh, you know.
know, I would hope to stay here while the rail is being built. I'm young, but you know, with things like the tax being extended being considered, I might have to leave. Like so many thousands of local families have to do a rally because it's just too expensive. But um, you know, let me, the situation is quite simple. It's that uh, the city has mismanaged its funding for this rail project, and now they're asking for even more money, show, even while showing that they couldn't spend the money responsibly the first time. And so, you know, my question now is not to the mayor or um, the gentleman from the director from Park, because it's clear where they stand, but it's to you guys, each of the representatives and the one state senator up there. I just want to know, yes or no, are you guys going to support the tax extension? Because I sure hope not, but yes or no, will you support the extension, each of you? That's a good question. Good question. <laughs> I voted yes on the House bill that um, proposes to cut the tax in half to point, from 0.5% to 0.25% for an unspecified number of years for the extension. Um, the, the, the Senate also has its position and uh, the bills will end up with what's called a conference committee, which means that the House and the Senate will have to work out differences in late April between the two bills. If there is no agreement, then the legislation dies this year. I supported that same proposal with reservations, and I'm asking and watching uh, what the city council is doing in terms of also stepping up and considering the other options that have been discussed at the uh, state legislature. Um, since 2005, I've always voted no the city of tax. actual town hall where people got to ask questions. <laughs> um, the mayor was here. We had uh, senators and representatives from the area as, long as, as well as the uh, council person, uh, Ann Kobayashi, from the area. I'm glad uh, we got to ask 